Hi, it's Paul Anderson, and this is Disciplinary Core Idea PS2A. This is on forces and motion. Motion we think of as movement, but we'll also find in science that lack of movement doesn't tell us that there's a lack of forces. It just means that the forces are balanced. And so what is a force? A force is essentially a push or a pull. And what scientist unlocked more of the mysteries of science than any other one related to force and motion? That's Sir Isaac Newton. Now, didn't Apple just fall on his head and all of this came to him? No, it's just a story. But he did a lot of work and even came up with calculus to help explain it. And so what is a force? A force, like I said, is a push or a pull. And it's best represented with an arrow. And so pulling on this pulley is a force. But there's also the force of gravity down on this box and the weight. And there's also a force between mag magnets as we try to push them together. And so there are two properties of every force that are important, the size and then the direction. And so if you've ever played Angry Birds, you know that when you pull the bird back, you're pulling it back a different amount, and that's going to be the size of the force you're going to give to the bird. And then you're pulling it at a different angle, and that's going to be the direction. So we should get our students thinking about it that way, and then starting to use arrows to represent forces. Newton, you're probably familiar with, came up with Newton's three laws, and those are super important. Newton's first law is this idea of inertia, that an object at rest stays at rest, and an object in motion stays in motion. And so this toilet paper sitting right here has no motion, but that simply means that the forces acting on it are balanced. And it might look like I have no motion right now as well, but I'm sitting on the earth and that's spinning and orbiting around the sun. And so it's just that as you look at me in your frame of reference, there's no uh, unbalanced forces acting on me. And so a fun thing you can play around with toilet paper is this, that it, it, it has a certain amount of inertia in it just as it sits there. And so you know that if you want a few sheets of paper off of the toilet paper, you can quickly rip them off because of that inertia is going to allow it to stay where it is. But if you pull it slowly, you can get more. So again, Newton's first law is really deals with inertia. What is Newton's second law? It's best represented by this equation you've probably seen before, force equals mass times acceleration. Most people know that, but they don't understand what it implies. And so if we have a, a basketball up here and you simply drop it, it doesn't fall at a, a constant rate. It's going to accelerate. And so the mass stays the same, we know. The force stays the same. What does that mean? Well, there's a force of gravity pulling down on it, and so it's going to accelerate. In other words, it's going to get faster and faster and faster and faster. And if we ever apply a constant force to something, and the mass stays the same, it's going to accelerate. Now, Newton was right, got us to the moon, but it doesn't always work. In other words, at high speed, as we approach the speed of light, force equals mass times acceleration doesn't. It kind of falls apart. Same thing at the small scale. Or what if we have a changing mass? It's not going to work. And so physicists kind of get irritated when you say force equals mass times acceleration because it doesn't explain everything. It does a pretty good job, but we had to add to that. What is Newton's third law? That's the thought law of opposition, that for every action there's an equal and opposite reaction. Great example of that could be this book sitting on a table. We know there's a force of gravity, that gravity is going to be pulling it down. So why doesn't it fall through the table? Well, there's an opposing force that's in the opposite direction. It's equal to that. And that's why it's not moving. It's hard to see that. And so if you had two people on ice skates, as you push against each other, you're both applying a force, but there's an equal and opposite force back. So when you push against a wall, the wall is literally pushing back on you. We don't see that until we're wearing ice skates and we start to eliminate that friction. Also, the idea of momentum is, is very important. What is momentum? It's um, the mass multiplied by times the velocity. And we don't want to kind of confuse our students with the equations, but what are the two things that determine momentum? How big it is and then how fast it's going. And it's conserved. In other words, you've seen this maybe before. It's Newton's cradle. What's happening is the momentum is transferred back and forth. But since all of these have the same exact mass, the velocity is going to be the same. Just like when you break when you're playing billiards, you're going to apply a force to this, and so you're going to get a velocity from the cue ball, but the, the, that's going to be conserved. And so all of these aren't going to move off at the same velocity because they have a greater mass. In other words, that mass is going to be conserved over time. And so where should you begin? Well, in elementary, at the lower, like in kindergarten, in the lower elementary grades, you should start talking about collisions. And what happens when two objects collide? Well, they're going to bounce off each other. They're going to affect each other. And so collisions are a great place to start. Anybody who's played Angry Birds understands what's going on when the bird hits the tower. Um, but we should really start talking about arrows. In other words, if we have a box like this, how can I move the box? 
Well, I could push on the box, so I could apply a force in one direction, or I could pull on the box, and both of those are going to create motion. Your students should also understand that even though we're pulling the box from the left to the right, there's going to be another force that's slowing it down. That's going to be friction, which is opposing that motion. And so as we're in the lower grades, you should understand kind of the idea of what a push or a pull is and how that's related to motion. As we move forward in elementary, we should start talking about objects at rest and this idea that the forces on them are balanced. And so this book, remember, doesn't move through the table or float up because there's a balance between the forces. In other words, the table must be pushing back. Otherwise, it would move down. Likewise, as this hangs, there's going to be a force down of gravity, but there must be an equal force up. How could we test that? Well, let's just cut the string here. What's it going to do? It's going to fall downward. And so we should now start to bring in the idea of forces. And those forces have two characteristics. Remember, the size and then the direction. We make the problem a little bit harder. What's the force acting on this right here? It's going to be the force of gravity down. And so where are the two forces acting on it? Well, there's going to be a force in this direction and this direction from the strings. And so that's kind of where we should leave it in elementary. As we move into middle, we should start to talk about Newton's laws. And we should start with Newton's third law of motion. That's this idea that for every action, there's an opposite equal reaction. And so again, the ice skaters that they push against each other are going to move away from each other. But that explains how a rocket works. And so why does a rocket move in this direction? It's because the, the matter or the rocket fuel as it moves off in this direction, we're going to get a force down and we're going to get an equal force up. And that's why a rocket moves. That's why it has to be so big to have so much mass of that rocket fuel. We should also start to talk about Newton's second law. And that's this idea that if you apply a force to an object, it's going to accelerate. So if the mass stays the same and the force stays the same, it's going to speed up. So if we drop that basketball, it's going to accelerate over time. Likewise, if I make me an object right now down here, if you apply a force to me and I'm a small mass, I'm going to move quickly. But if I'm a large mass, I'm not going to move as quickly um, if you apply a force to it. And you know this to be true. If you push a car, if it's heavy, it takes you a while to apply that force. But once you get it going, it's going to start to accelerate. And so we don't have to do math in middle school, but we should start to understand this idea, especially of acceleration, which is really misunderstood. We should also explain the, the importance of a frame of reference. And so this is a real simple one. If we're both, if we have two people and they're on either side of a road and they're watching a car move in this direction. And so if you're on this side, it's going to look like it's going from right to left. But if you're on the other side of the road, it's going to look like it's moving from left to right. So that's a real simple example. But let's look at a more difficult example. Let's say we have two cars. This one's going slow and this one's going fast. Let's say this one's going 30 miles an hour and this one's going 50 miles an hour. Well, we could make our frame of reference like it is in this picture, that we're sitting back and we're watching both of these move. Or we could put our frame of reference right here. If we're in this car right here, we don't sense this motion. All we're going to see is this car coming behind us. And it's going to be look like it's coming at us at 20 miles an hour. And so again, that frame of reference is super important. As we move into high school, then we should start to do a little bit of math related to Newton's second law. Know this, however, that it doesn't work at the small scale. This is Max Planck, the father of quantum theory. As we get smaller and smaller and smaller, we have to use quantum mechanics to understand what's going on. And then as we move faster and faster and faster, approach the speed of light, Einstein's idea of relativity is going to make more sense. And so what do we know about Newton's law? It explains how a constant force can apply. Uh, as we apply a constant force to a mass, it's going to accelerate. And we can play around with these values. But as we get real small and really, really fast, it doesn't work. And then the last thing we could leave them with is this idea of conservation of momentum. And if we're going to do some simple problems, mass times velocity is going to be momentum. And so we'll use P to represent momentum. So again, that momentum of the cue ball is going to equal the momentum of all of those balls after we break. And what's neat about that is if we think of the force as an arrow, we could take all the arrows of these motions right here, and that should sum up to that arrow of that original motion of the cue ball. And so what is forces? It's pushes and pulls. What does it do? It creates motion or a lack of motion if they're balanced. And I hope that was helpful.